high performance computing, or at least bring us up to date as to what does high performance computing mean. So let's get up the on next, next Thursday. So there I have the right here of introducing somebody that is probably very, very well known to you, Andrew Luisi. He's Chief Security Officer, right? Uh, information Security Officer. Information Security Officer. We want our information to be secure, and he's a good guy to do it. And today he's going to tell you a little bit about the history of computers. If you don't think there has been a history, just listen to him. You'll recognize yourself and you were in the diapers. Anyway, let's welcome our speaker. Well, thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the creation of the stored program computer, which is the kind of computer that we're pretty used to, that has a memory we stick instructions in with a processor that interprets them. I'm also going to be discussing some of the early abstractions that were created during the first few years to make it easier to program these machines. The word abstraction has several sort of related meanings that are subtly different. So I'll start by sharing my definition for today. When I say abstractions, I'm referring to tools and concepts that allow a programmer, so this is within a programming context, to disregard details that are unrelated to the essential nature of the problem being solved. So the key sentence that you'll hear me say uh, variations of throughout this talk is, a given abstraction allows the programmer to think of this instead of that. Where typically this is something that's a little easier for us humans to deal with. So this is, this is a service to the humans. The computers don't care. So for example, the C++ string class allows the programmer to think about strings instead of character arrays. This is an incomplete family tree of some of the early computers. Today, I'm going to be very briefly mentioning the Harvard Mark I and the ENIAC, mostly by way of background. They're not my main point, however. Uh, the EDVAC is, is, a key, is a key step. Uh, this, is, this is the early, uh, the first published idea for a stored program computer. I'm going to spend most of my time discussing the EDSAC, which I know it's, it's sort of difficult to read on the screen, but here's the EDSAC uh, in Cambridge, England, and I'll touch on some of the work at Manchester University very, very briefly. So some of the ideas that I'm going to be discussing today are winners, and I mean that quite literally in the sense that they won. They won so completely, so thoroughly that we, we breathe them, we swim in them all day, every day. It's difficult sometimes to imagine things being any other way. So I'm starting uh, my story a little before the beginning today to, to provide some contrast. So this is the Harvard Mark I. It came online in the early 1940s. It was a collaboration between Howard Eichen at Harvard and some folks at IBM. And it was an electromechanical device. It, kept, it was decimal. It kept track of individual digits by how wheels were rotated. It had drive shafts with spinning drives running throughout the whole machine to provide physical power. And it took its instructions from paper tape readers. So you'd feed these really wide paper tapes in. It would read an instruction from paper tape and execute the instruction while it was reading it. If you wanted it to execute a set of instructions multiple times, you literally glued your piece of paper tape into a loop. One of my favorite stories about these machines, it's actually a later machine out of the Harvard lab, but uh, John Bacchus tells a story about a program that was running over and over again, and one of the inputs that it used was a set of data on a paper tape that it was using over and over again, and every other time they ran the program, they got completely nonsensical results. And it turned out when they glued the data tape into a loop, they had accidentally made a Mobius strip. <laughs> so every other time, 
all the holes on the paper tape were backwards, making the numbers essentially meaningless. So this, this could do about five or six editions per second. This was the state of the art. 1946, the ENIAC comes online. The ENIAC is general purpose and digital and automatic and electronic. The part about being automatic, meaning that it can sort of run on its own, you set up what it's going to do and it just goes, and being, being electronic is the key combination. And by electronic, what I mean is it kept track of the values of numbers purely through the states of electronic circuits. And it did its computation purely by changing the states of electronic circuits. Nothing physical had to move for the ENIAC to do any calculations. This allowed it to perform at amazing speeds. It could do 5,000 additions per second. Now remember I just said the state of the art before, five or six additions per second. This is a thousand-fold increase in the state of the art in one device. I'm not aware of any development in the history of computing other than this one that has given us three orders of magnitude in one development. The way the ENIAC was programmed, it had, it had the various accumulators and other devices all around the edge of the room, as you can see, and you literally rewired it. It had data buses running around above connections where you would you would hook a data bus into the input for one unit of the machine, or you'd hook the output from a unit of the machine into one of the data buses, and it had control buses running around the bottom. So you'd, you'd, hook, a line, you'd hook a control line into a control unit on one of the parts of the machine, and you'd set on a knob what the unit was to do when it got a pulse on that line. And then when it was done, it could send out a pulse that you would route to another control line. So You'd, you'd wire these up to do whatever you wanted it to do in a particular sequence. So we have this extreme speed from being purely electronic, but it can take hours to change what program is on this machine. A program for the ENIAC was literally a wiring diagram. So we've kind of got this trade-off. You look at the Harvard Mark I, we can change programs very easily. We just put a different paper tape into it, but it only runs at five or six instructions per second. You look at the ENIAC, it takes hours to change what program is running on it, but it can do 5,000 editions per second. So is there some way we can get the best of both worlds? Well, on January 29th, 1944, J. Presper Eckert writes a memo. He's part of the ENIAC team. They've frozen the design for the ENIAC in 1943, but it won't come online until 46. So they're already thinking about the next machine they're going to build. And he describes this idea of a high-speed internal memory. So external memory is, think punch cards, punch tapes, um, magnetic wire or magnetic tape, that sort of thing. But the internal memory is something that's addressable, that can be changed at runtime, and Initially, what he proposed was a disk that had a magnetic surface around the edge of the disk with a read-write head. And so what you would do is you would load the instructions as data into the memory. And this control unit down here would be wired with the same algorithm all the time. So not like the ENIAC, where we're changing what's, what algorithm is wired into the machine. We have one algorithm always wired into the machine. It's a fetch-execute cycle. It fetches an instruction from internal memory, decides what to do based on what that instruction is. Later on, they changed. Oh, by the way, this diagram is not from the 1944 memo. This is from a 1946 lecture. There weren't any diagrams in the original, but it's the same idea. So later in the year, they, they realized that a moving disk is still moving. It's too slow. So they came up with, with an idea inspired by some of the radar work for a mercury delay line, so a tube full of mercury that has a piezoelectric crystal at each end, so like a quartz crystal at each end of a tube full of mercury. And one crystal generates an ultrasonic pulse. Bzz, that pulse travels through the mercury. It gets picked up by the crystal at the other end. We detect that signal. And then we generate a new 
ultrasonic pulse back at the beginning. Well, the width of an electron, uh, the width of an ultrasonic pulse is very narrow compared to the length of the tube. So we're able to have a lot of these pulses in the tube at one time. And whether there is a pulse or not in any particular point represents a 1 or a 0. So in order to read a bit out, we, we have a counter. We're keeping track of which pulse is going around at any given moment. We wait for the one that we want, and we read it out, send it off somewhere else in the machine. In order to write a bit into memory, we have to wait for that bit to be coming around, and then we either force a, a pulse to be injected or force there to be no pulse injected. Uh, so September 1944, John von Neumann joins the ENIAC project. And he, he works with them on some stuff, and he writes up a report on this new machine that they're planning to build. Uh, it's called the EDVAC, Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer. And this becomes one of the most important documents in computer history that was never officially published. Wasn't, wasn't published at the time in any magazines or any journals, but uh, von Neumann and Goldstein shared it with a few hundred of their closest friends which sort of amounted to everyone uh, in almost everyone in the Western world working on automatic com computation at the time. So now the, the idea is out there. Everyone knows about the ENIAC. Everyone knows that electronic computation is possible. The idea for the stored program computer is out there. And a practical plan for how to make it is out there. Lots of universities start working on plans to build one of these things. But even before any of them come online, there's already this, this, this real optimistic tone that comes into the literature. And there's already work on how are we going to program these things once they start working. So one idea that starts showing up really early is the concept of a subroutine. Uh, it, it shows up in some of John Mockley's 1946 Moore School lectures shows up in uh, some of the memos that von Neumann and Goldstein published, uh, 47, 48. And the idea here is, and this, this should be fairly familiar to most of you, we, we have instructions that we're executing. And at some point, we go and we start running a subroutine. And then we return back to where we were. So this, this allows us to write one set of instructions for something we want to do several times. For example, if we want to do it in multiple different programs, or if we want to run it multiple times within the same program. But it also allows us to imagine that we've added a new instruction to our computer. So for example, division is kind of a complicated process compared to, say, addition or subtraction or even multiplication. So there's this trade-off. Do we, do we put in all the wiring necessary to give our computer a division instruction? Or now, with this idea, we have the ability to potentially write a subroutine to handle division for us. And this allows the programmer to think about the action of the subroutine as a whole instead of the individual instructions that it executes. This is, when used correctly, this can be a good abstraction or a bad abstraction. right? You can, you can use it as just an abbreviation, where, oh, sometimes I need to run these six instructions, so I jump into the subroutine to run these six instructions. Or if you use it as a good abstraction, a good abstraction has meaning independent from its implementation. Then you can just think of it as, I do a division, I do a square root, or Whatever, whatever the idea is that's encapsulated here. We also get flowcharts. Now, obviously, the exact notation is different from modern flowcharts. But the idea here is, well, we're going to be feeding this machine a whole bunch of numbers to tell it what to do. It's difficult to think about a bunch of numbers as instructions while trying to design an algorithm. So instead, what we do, we write out formulas, we write out actions, assignments, conditionals, branches. We can write a branch as a literal branch within the flow diagram. 
And this makes it, this allows the programmer to think about the overall process and algorithm being programmed instead of the specific numbers that are going to be stuck into the computer's memory. So uh, time marches on, June 21st, 1948. Uh, the small-scale experimental machine comes on online in Man at Manchester University, also known as the Manchester Baby. This was mostly an experiment to prove that the concept was viable. It used, it used CRTs, or cathode ray tubes, as its memory. It literally stored bits as dots on the screen, which were then sensed by, a by the electron beam with lower power and then they had to be refreshed and, and so forth. The, so the, the small-scale the, the small scale experimental machine, or the Manchester baby, proved that the stored program computer could work. It proved that the CRT-based memory they were going to use could work. To the best of my knowledge, it only ran three programs. It was mostly a proof of concept on the way to building the Manchester Mark I, uh, which was the first large-scale machine at Manchester. May 6, 1949, the EDSAC comes online at Cambridge, England. And this is the first practical stored program computer. It was built by a team led by Maurice Wilkes. It used a 17-bit word. Five of those bits were the instruction code, when, when it was interpreted as an instruction. Sometimes, right, sometimes you interpret a word as a number that you're doing arithmetic on. Sometimes you interpret it as an instruction that you're executing. So, when it's an instruction, five bits of that word are the action, the order, the operation that's going to be performed. This, this five bits was chosen to match the fact that the teletype code they were using was five bits wide. So, so what, what they did was the instruction for an ad used the bit pattern that corresponded to the bit pattern in the teletype code for the letter A. <laughs> so we're already seeing, again, before the machine even comes online, before we've even got any practical stored program computers operational, we're already seeing these efforts at abstraction, where now we're trying to let the programmer think in terms of the operation that's going to be performed instead of the raw bits that we're feeding the machine. Now, somehow we have to get a program into the computer. And there are different ways to solve this problem. The, the way that they chose on the EDSAC was when the computer was first turned on, they had a set of so-called initial orders that got loaded into the memory at address 0, starting at address 0, and then got executed starting at address 0. So this is the first set of initial orders written by David Wheeler. And it... These, these numbers here are the addresses, and then these are the um, instructions. So we've, we've already got the operation code here. We have decimal numbers being read in to the address. These get loaded into the 10-bit address part of the instruction. And then we have a terminating character that says whether it's a single or double length arithmetic. So again, we're already converting from decimal into binary while we're loading the instructions into memory. So we're getting this, this gap is appearing between the bits that are being executed and the program that the programmer writes and loads into the computer. And it's this gap that allows us over time to make, to make the syntax, the form, of the program the programmer writes more and more friendly to the human being and less and less directly constrained by what the computer does or can do. Later on in 1949, uh, David Wheeler writes a second set of initial orders. And he adds a whole lot of features to this second set. It has the ability to, to support relocatable code. So you can write a piece of code and all the internal references in it will get adjusted appropriately while it's being loaded into memory. You can load this piece of code anywhere you like, and it will still work. He adds, uh, we get the ability to set the location of subsequent instructions. Start storing, start storing instructions 
here in memory now. We get the ability to save the current destination. Wherever it is you're about to stick the next instruction, yeah, save that value for me, please. We get variables. We get the ability to store a value into, there's a limited number of variables that we can use at load time while the program's being loaded, where we can store a value in the variable, and then we can add one of those variables to an instruction while the instruction's being loaded into memory. It's read from tape. The conversion for the operation is done. The conversion from decimal to binary is done. And if we like, we're now able to have some variable added to it by the time it lands in memory, before, before the program even starts executing. This is while it's being loaded into memory. We get the ability to jump into the program in arbitrary locations. We get the ability to, oh, and, and while your program is running, if you haven't overwritten the initial orders, you can jump back into them to have them read more code in for you, if you like. Now, in order to add all of these features, David Wheeler did need more than 30 instructions. In fact, he needed a whole 40 instructions. This is one of my favorite pieces of code in all of computer history. I would, I would stack this up against any virus when it comes to functionality per instruction. It, um, and we already see, and again, we're still in 1949, less than a year after the first stored program computers come online, we're already seeing programming techniques that would become common later on. We see the concept of a control switch, where you can, um, if you've got a value, you want to do one of different, if you have a value and you wish to perform one of multiple different actions based on that value, you can test it and jump here, or test it and jump there, and then test it and jump somewhere else. Or you can add that value to a base address and then just jump to that location. So there's one of the, those in here. We have the concept of multiple entry points, where if you have a thing that you want to do sometimes, you write some code for that, and sometimes you want to do that same thing plus a little more, you can put a little more code at the beginning of it, you can either jump here and do the thing, or you can jump here a little bit earlier and do the thing plus a little bit more. Very common assembly language technique. We see self-modifying code here. For example, in address 20, it starts out as an H8F. I'm not going to go into the details of how this works or the instruction set, but it starts out as an H8F. And later on, depending on what's going on during the loading process, it can be one of these other values. We see instructions used as data. The exploitation of the fact that they're stored in the same memory, they're stored the same way. So sometimes the, there's, the instruction has a numerical value. And that numerical value can be used as a numerical constant in a calculation as well. Now, this is normally frowned upon now, but back then it was considered rather clever. It, it saved space. For the relocation, what happens is the GK control combination saves the address that you're about to store into, right? the address of the next instruction, gets saved in storage location 42. So that becomes the address that this A1F gets stashed in. That address is stored into location 42. When you terminate an instruction with a theta, that causes the value of address, the value that is stored in location 42, to be added to that instruction while it's loaded. So when this E4 theta is read from paper tape, by the time it lands in memory, it has changed. And this isn't a 4 anymore. This is the address that is four instructions after the A1F. So this E4 theta always refers to this T10F at the end here, wherever this gets loaded into memory. For actually calling subroutines, the, the early computers, the EDSAC in particular, but, but a lot of early computers, had no instructions specifically for supporting subroutines. There was no concept of a hardware stack. So 
the programmers had to come up with a way to transfer control into the subroutine and to get control back on their own. The, this is the method David Wheeler came up with, where if you look up at the first instruction up there, it's in address n. The instruction is add, or ANF, that's an add instruction. The accumulator has to start out as zero when this code runs. AN adds the contents of location n into the accumulator. Well, what is in location n? The ANF instruction is in location n. Then we jump, the, the GMF jumps down here to the subroutine. Here's where the subroutine begins. At this point, that ANF instruction is in the accumulator. Now we run an A3F that adds the contents of location 3 into the accumulator. There's a magical value kept in location 3, specifically for this purpose, which when added to an add instruction, turns it into a jump instruction. And a jump instruction with an address that is too higher. So, that ANF up there magically turns into an E, that's a jump, an E, N plus 2F. What's N plus 2? N plus 2 is the instruction after the call to the subroutine. So, the so after this addition, the accumulator contains an instruction that jumps back to the calling code right after the subroutine call. The T, N plus R, this transfers the contents of the accumulator down here into location M plus R. Subroutine runs, does its thing. When we get here, we execute that jump instruction. Boom! Takes us back to right after the subroutine call. Another idea that they come up with is the concept of an interpretive subroutine. This is a subroutine that reads instructions and does something based on what they are. But they're not instructions for the EDSAC specifically. They're instructions for some other machine that doesn't really exist. <laughs> Nowadays, we call this a virtual machine. Oh one, one application of this was floating point arithmetic. The EDSAC used, flixed, the EDSAC used fixed point arithmetic. One of the ways you could do floating point arithmetic was to run an interpretive subroutine that implemented a virtual machine that was a lot like the EDSAC, but which had a floating point accumulator and floating point memory addresses. And then you can perform floating point additions and subtractions and multiplications and divisions in code that you write for this interpretive subroutine. Popping over to Manchester, and I'm, I'm sort of trying to take this in chronological order, mostly. Popping over to Manchester, when the Manchester Mark I comes online, it has, it has a, these are, these are CRTs, these are cathode ray tubes we're staring at, with literal, these lines are literally lines of bits you could see on the screen. Uh, CI is the current instruction, this is what we would now call uh, we now call this the instruction pointer. This is the address of the instruction we're about to interpret. That instruction gets loaded from the main memory into PI, the present instruction. Nowadays, we call it an instruction register, typically, or something like that, which then gets interpreted. The, the interesting thing is, if you look, there's, there's this addition that goes on. While the instruction is being loaded from main storage, in to the present instruction. It gets added to the contents of one of these lines on the B tube. So B0 is, is typically always 0. But B1 can be changed. And so if we run the same instruction a bunch of times and we change B1 each time, that instruction is actually referring to different addresses in memory. So this allows us, for example, to have a loop where each, where we're, we're adding up a bunch of numbers in an array. And each time through the loop, the same instruction unmodified refers to a different number. On the EDSAC and a lot of other early computers, 
you had to write self-modifying code to do that. Just to add up all the numbers and addresses 100 through 120, you needed to modify the instruction to do that. Nowadays, we call this an index register. This allowed the programmer to read the code and more or less assume that, well, it reduced self-modification. And by reducing self-modification, it allowed the programmer to more or less assume that the instruction I'm looking at is actually the instruction that's going to be there and going to get executed when the computer gets there. So it allows the, the programmer to think about the instructions originally written instead of having to think about the entire execution history of the program before that instruction executes. Uh, OK, back to Cambridge. We also get the concept of an assembler. Now, I'm not referring to assembly language in the modern sense. This is a far more limited concept. This assembles a bunch of subroutines together into a program. So on our input, we have the assembler on the tape. Then we have a master routine and a, and a bunch of subroutines. The assembler builds up a jump table, a table with a bunch of jump instructions that then jump into each one of these. So now, when I want to run subroutine number three, I don't have to pay attention to where I loaded it in memory or, or how much was before it in memory. I just, I just have to think of which subroutine I want to call. I want to call subroutine number three. This allowed the programmer to think about the subroutine you want to call instead of having to worry about the address where it gets loaded. We got this concept, OK. Um, 1951. So only two years have passed, by the way, since the first practical stored program computer came online. All of this is happening very quickly. Only two years have passed. 1951, Maurice Wilkes publishes a paper called The Best Way to Design an Automatic Calculating Machine. Now, do not be fooled by the excessive modesty of this title. It is actually a spectacularly good idea, and one which is extremely common now. <laughs> Nowadays, we call this microcode. So the idea here, we've got this register full of bits. Each one of these boxes is a bit. It goes into a decoding tree. Timing pulse comes in. Depending on the value of this register, that timing pulse comes out exactly one of these horizontal lines. This is a diode matrix. So each of these black dots is a diode, which allows a pulse to travel from one of the horizontal lines to one of the vertical lines. So pulse comes in, goes across one of these lines, comes out some vertical lines. These, are extreme, these go out, they open gates in different places in the machine. These do extremely simple things, th things that can happen within one cycle. Right? You transmit to the data bus, you receive to the data bus. You transmit to the ALU, you transmit to the ALU, you load the output from the ALU. So, so one cycle instructions, sort of, that are coming out from these vertical lines. Then we go into matrix B. And incidentally, we've got a, well, I'll come back to that. But the signal comes over one of the horizontal lines, comes out some subset of the vertical lines, passes through a delay of some sort, and then gets loaded into this register for the next cycle. And by the way, the idea here is we've got the sign bit from the, from the accumulator. And if the signal comes across this wire, depending on the sign bit, it either goes up this one or down this one. So this allows us to implement conditionals. Now, this particular diagram is actually very special to me personally because I, uh, my personal history, I was a math major. I sort of started way at the top of the abstraction hierarchy, just thinking about numbers and formulas um, in the abstract. And then in computer land, I sort of worked my way down through programming languages and operating systems and libraries and compilers and uh, assemblers uh, till I sort of eventually kind of understood the concept of machine code. And then separately, I worked my way up in my, in my independent studying through, through tubes and transistors, logic gates, ALUs, memory, that sort of thing. But I, I struggled for a long time. There was this big gray area for me in the, in the distance between hardware and software. I struggled to understand 
how I hook a bunch of logic gates together to have them actually implement an algorithm so they could do a fetch execute loop, interpret my, my code that I write, my machine code. So there was this big fuzzy space there for me. And I was staring at this diagram and I realized, wait a minute, this is like a state and this is like an input and this is like a mapping between state and input to a new state. Oh, and this is a mapping from a state to an output. Oh my god, it's a finite state machine with output. I know how to implement an algorithm with that. And in an instant, this gray area disappeared. I saw the connection. And I saw the whole hierarchy in my mind. It was, it was almost like a religious experience. <laughs> and when I finally came back to Earth, I sort of felt like Neo in the Matrix after he learned Kung Fu. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's really, it's a wonderful experience. Those of you who haven't had it yet, um, look forward to it. You know, for you it's not going to be microcode, it'll be something in compilers or operating systems or ALU design or whatever, but when that last piece falls into place, it, it really is an amazing experience and it's worth it. Keep at it. Another concept that comes across in uh, 1952 Maurice Wilkes publishes the idea of what he calls synthetic orders. Nowadays, we typically call them macros, where we have an instruction that isn't actually part of the machine's instruction code, but our loading program expands it into some sequence of instructions. So much like subroutines, this allows the programmer to think about an overall action instead of the specific instructions that implement that action. We also get the concept of floating labels. Now, for the relocation that I mentioned earlier, we have, we have offsets from the beginning of the subroutine. So you're still thinking in terms of, when you're doing a jump, you're still thinking in terms of, I'm, OK, I'm jumping to the instruction that's 10 past the beginning. The idea here is we label an instruction. So this, this V99F has the label 3 star on it. Up there, we've got the A3 star S. That 3 star up there doesn't get loaded into memory, neither does this 3 star. What happens is when that A3 star S gets loaded into memory, that contains the address of this instruction. So this allows the programmer to think about the instruction you want to refer to, jump to, load, store to, whatever. It allows the programmer to think about the specific instruction instead of the address that it's going to be loaded into. So I've whizzed through quite a bit here. And I'm going to take a moment to recap. What we've got in 1952, so three years, three years after the EDSAC comes online, we've got most of modern assembly language. The big thing that's missing is strings as labels. But we've got, we've got the concept of the stored program computer, hardware interpreting software. We've got B lines or index registers. We've got microcode, which allows you to sort of separate the design of the hardware. It allows you to think about the hardware design without worrying too much about your fe fetch execute loop. And it allows you to write your fetch execute loop without having to worry too much about wiring diagrams. I mean, you have to know how the rest of the computer is wired, but you're not thinking, you're not creating a wiring diagram like you are in, say, the ENIAC when you write your fetch execute loop with microcode. You're mostly designing a finite state machine and then encoding it. We have mnemonics allowing us to think about the instruction that we're writing instead of the bit, the, instead of the bits that the computer will interpret. Relocation, allowing us to worry about the operations we want to perform instead of where they're going to be loaded in memory. Decimal addresses, letting us think in terms of decimal like us humans are used to instead of binary or octal or hex. Subroutines, macros, allowing us to think about a group of instructions in terms of one operation, allowing us to pretend we're programming a machine that's bigger than it actually is, more featureful than it actually is. We have interpretive subroutines or virtual machines that allow us to pretend we're programming a machine that doesn't even exist. It allows us to think in terms of the operations we want to perform instead of the operations that actually occur 
when the computer is running. We have program assemblers, which allow us to think about what subroutine we want to call instead of where it's loaded in memory. Floating labels letting us think about what instruction we want to deal with instead of where it's loaded in memory. So even with all of this abstraction, we still have a fundamental limitation. It's still very linear, very sequential. It's still one thing after another. And we humans don't think about a lot of things in the world in purely sequential terms. For example, this is the formula for one of the roots of a quadratic equation. Now, if you were to evaluate this after I gave you values for a, b, and c, of course you would do it in some order. You would, you would do your operations in some order, one thing after another. But when I look at this, when I write it down, when I manipulate it on paper, we don't think of it as a sequence of operations. We think of it more in a structured manner. This is, this is a division, and it, it's got two parts. There's this stuff that's divided by this stuff. Uh, this is an addition, and it's this stuff plus that stuff. This is a square root sign. It's an operation we perform on whatever this stuff becomes. There's, there's sort of a, a structure that we impose on it mentally, and this isn't this isn't something that really exists in the computer, typically. It, it's how we think about things. If I convert this into a sequence of instructions, sort of at the level of assembly code, it loses a lot of the structure. Now, these aren't, uh, these aren't assembly language instructions. Obviously, these are Python. But I have limited myself here to the size of operations we would do in assembly language. So, just a load from memory, a store to memory, a single multiplication or addition. Uh, over here, when we take the square root, that would be a subroutine call in, in machine code. Uh, the division here would be a subroutine call on a lot of early computers. Uh, a lot of them didn't implement division, as I said. Now, you can figure out what this does if you spent long enough staring at it and working it out with pencil and paper, but it's not obvious. If I just hand you this code, you're not going to recognize this as the root of a quadratic equation as quickly as if I show you this equation, this formula. So is there some way that we could work with these inside a computer? Unfortunately, we can't put that on a punch card or a paper tape. But we could put that on a punch card or a paper tape. By the way, these two stars here is exponentiation. This is b squared. And the question is, is there some way that we could feed this into the computer and expand the distance between the bits that are executed and the input that we type even farther? Is there some way that we could put that formula into the computer and have our loading program create these instructions for us? Would it be possible to write an automatic formula translator. I'm sure that absolutely none of you will be surprised to hear that the answer is yes. But that is another story. 